Hey guys, good afternoon. It's Carissa with the Praying Warriors Tribe. I'm here today to do week one, day three of Steadfast Love, a study of Psalms 107 by Lauren Chandler. Please excuse all the commotion that's going on around me. I am taking a quick little break off of work. Um, normally I do work third shift, but on Saturdays I stay over all day long as well. So, um, I am, I'm, I missed yesterday and I didn't want this to sit an additional day without me doing something. So I'm just taking a quick little break to come out here and do this video. Um, today's, uh, today's lesson today's Bible study is called the Lord and it is actually a really great study on names and the importance of names and I had done this actually a little while ago um, when I was reading a book called the Deborah anointing by Michelle McLean Walters um, within that book they had gone over the meaning of, um, of judge from, uh, I think judges four of the prophetess Deborah and they had gone over her name. And I was really curious at that time as to what my name actually meant. So I've done a little bit of study on my name, but this took me a little bit deeper and, and I went a little bit further with it. Um, so I actually really encourage you guys to look up the meaning of your own names. Typically, um, you know, we're, we are not just randomly named. Like we, we have our names in the book of life. Um, our names have meanings and our names are really, truly significant to us and to who we are. So I looked up the name Carissa. And it's spelled um, not traditionally with a C, but with a K. And it meant um, grace, beloved, filled with grace and kindness and very dear. And I just, I, I love that. Like, I just, I can't help but just love that. And then my middle name is Anne. Very uh, Southern middle name here. That is also gracious merciful and it's a Hebrew form of Hannah and it means favor and grace. So um, grace seems to be like a very significant part of who I am and uh, the meaning behind my names which I find very amazing because you know this year for me personally, like I really focused on the grace of God for me and he has been refining me in a big way of extending grace to those that I have a hard time with. <laughs> um, it's been, it's been some refining here. So I, I just find that, you know, kind of ironic. Anyway, so have you ever gone by another name? And this is a mental exercise. Uh, do some names recall good memories and emotions and others not so good? Um, so there's really only three other names that I've gone by and it's been a variation of my first name. It's been Rissa um, or it's been Riss, R-I-S, or my sisters have lovingly christened me as sugar pain, you know, being the youngest of three and having some years in between us, uh, I was definitely sweet yet a pain in the rear. <laughs> so anyways, um, Lauren continues on here saying growing up, my parents called me boo boo or boo for short. I'm not exactly sure where the name originated from, but it's always been a term of endearment. In fact, Matt and I call our girls Boo, too. I can recall other names given to me, one in particular that I acquired during junior high. As with many junior high memories, I'm sure you can imagine that it stirs up awkward, anxious, and self-conscious feelings. I still have a complex over the body part this name mocked. 
to be fair, I cringe over the teasing I dispensed at that time in my life. I was by no means only a victim. Names are powerful, aren't they? They may evoke various feelings and moments that have been seared in our minds, for better or worse. They help define and distinguish the named. So if our names have less than pleasing meanings or connotations, they can negatively mark our perceptions of ourselves and how we feel we are perceived by others. Likewise, if our name means something profound or pleasant, we tend to flourish under their influence. Names are a big deal to God. In various places throughout scripture, he took the initiative to change a person's name to signify a new thing he was doing in and through that person. So if you wanted to look these up, you could fill out um, this table there's a table that I filled out already. And um, I'll give you the scripture. The first scripture that we will go to is Genesis 17, verse 5. The original name was Abram, and the meaning was exalted father. The new name that God changed it to was Abraham, and it means father of a multitude. In Genesis 17, 50, 15, excuse me, 17, 15, the original name was Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, and it means my princess. The new name was Sarah, still meaning princess. Genesis 25, 26, and 32, 28, the original name was Jacob, which means take, takes by the heels takes by the heel, he cheats and supplanter. The new name that God changed Jacob's name to was Israel. He strives with God or God strives. Let me go into the New Testament and we have John chapter 1 verses 40 through 42. The original name was Simon. He, meaning God, has heard. And the, new, the new name is um Safas, Safas, C E P H A S, which we call Peter, and it means rock. And then the last verse that we're going to, that we're going to discuss is Acts thirteen verse nine. The original name was Saul, and that meaning was asked or prayed for, and the new meaning is Paul, little or small. And I actually want to read the commentary on this one because this one um, is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, in the Passion Translation here, it goes, Saul means sought after and Paul means little. The name change is descriptive of what happened within Paul, leaving behind greatness in his own eyes and being content to be insignificant. This is the journey that every believer must take. So Saul is an outlier among the others. He did not have a you shall no longer be called moment with God. From what we know in scripture, it appears he chose to go by his Roman name, Paul. So knowing that the name Saul is of Hebrew origin and Paul is Roman, why do you think he chose to go by his Roman name? Well, in Acts 13, 44 through 49, let's just read. I will read that one real quick. Acts 13, 44. So in it, it says the following week, nearly everyone in the city gathered to hear the word of God. When the Jewish leaders saw the size of the crowds, vicious jealousy filled their hearts, and they rose up to oppose what Paul was teaching. They insulted him and argued with him over everything he said. Yet Paul and Barnabas did not back down. Filled with courage, they boldly replied, We were compelled to bring God's message first to you Jews, but seeing you've rejected this message and refused to embrace eternal life, we will focus instead on the nations and offer it to them. 
This will fulfill what the Lord has commanded us. I have destined you to become a beacon light for the nations and release salvation to the ends of the earth. When the non-Jewish people in the crowd heard these words, they were thrilled and they honored the word of the Lord. All who believed that they were destined to experience eternal life received the message. God's word spread like wildfire throughout the entire region. So why do you think he chose to go by his Roman name? And I think it's so he could better connect with the non-Jews that he was preaching and teaching to all the time. Paul recognized the call of God on his life to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, non-Jews. Paul's name change signified his acceptance and made him more accessible to those to whom he'd been called. That Paul means little or small endears him that much more to me. It echoes what he wrote to the Christians in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. But he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you, and my power finds its full expression through your weaknesses. So I will celebrate my weaknesses, for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So let's take this just a little bit further. God has given himself names that define an aspect of his character that makes him relatable to us. We're only going to focus on three names because there are so many. And I encourage you, honestly, I encourage you to go and look up as many names as you can because each name really does have an attribute of his character. So the first scripture is Genesis 14 verse 8, excuse me, 14 verse 18, it says, Then Mel Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of El Elyon. So the name of God in this is El Elyon, and it means God most high. In Genesis 17, 1 through 2, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, Adonai appeared to him and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Continually walk before me and you will be blameless. My heart's desire is to make my covenant between me and you, and then I will multiply you ex exceedingly much. So the Hebrew name here is El, Sh El Shaddai. And it means God Almighty. And then the last verse that we're going to look up is Exodus 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. The Hebrew name for this is Yahweh. And it means I am. That is the name of God. We could fill pages with names of God mentioned in the Bible. And I have actually, when I was looking up my own name, I actually looked up several of God's names as well because I wanted to, well, initially my, uh, my desire for that was I was really and truly looking for a name to call him in the midst of my prayers, my personal prayers, that was something more than just Lord or Heavenly Father. So I encourage you to look up those names. I encourage you to get personal with it because um, it truly is just so amazing once you grasp more of what his character is because his, characters, his character shines through in his names. Um, let's see here. So we could fill pages with names for God mentioned in the Bible, but I want to hone in on the last one in the table, Yahweh. Most often, it is translated as the Lord in English. Uh, so in Exodus 6, verse 2 through 8, which I don't have my Bible here, so I didn't write this out, um, but it asks, to whom did God reveal his name, the Lord, Yahweh? And in that verse, it was to Moses to say to the children of Israel who were in bondage needing rescuing from the Egyptians. 
who knew him by another name. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew him as El Shaddai, as God Almighty. And what were God's people experiencing when he revealed his name, Yahweh? They were experiencing enslavement. So, um, in Exodus 6, verses 6 through 8, I want you to just listen. And I want you to hear every time that I say the word I and think about the verb that expresses a mental or physical action. Think about that that is spoken afterwards, okay? So therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you as an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So who is doing most of the acting in that passage? Yahweh. Yahweh is doing most of the acting. So Yahweh the Lord is God's covenant-making and covenant-keeping name. He is reminding his people that he has not forgotten about them. He has heard their groaning. He knows their oppression. And he is about to do something about it. In Psalms 107, Yahweh is the name the psalmist chooses to use. I like to think that he is reminding God's people that the Lord, that Yahweh will deliver, free, and redeem those who cry out to him. The very next verse after Moses tells, excuse me, the very next verse after God tells Moses all he will do for his people says, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. But they did not listen to Moses because their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Impatience and despondency and because of their forced labor. It's another version that I looked up for that. Lord, let it not be so of us. May we not miss hearing your promise to deliver because our ears are more attuned to our brokenness and pain. May we cry out to the Lord, the one who is, who he says he is, and will do what he says he will do. So where are you? Can you hear his promise to deliver over your brokenness and pain? Or is his voice drowned out? I encourage you to write a prayer of confession. Confess where you are and where you want to be. Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you so much that you are a God who you are who you say you are and you will do as you say you will do. There is not a promise that you break. There is nothing that you won't do for us. You never, ever fail. And I just praise you in this moment that you will rescue us, that you will deliver us. And I ask for ears to hear and eyes to see as your hand moves on us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Okay, that is it for today. I'm sorry that it's a day late, <laughs> um, but I hope you guys are blessed by it. And I will see you next time. God bless. Mwah.